This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us. With me today is Richard Fields and John Cameron, and I am never going to get used to that new intro. <laughs> it just it well, it's, seems it's short, so you know that there's some benefit in that. I know, but I I, I still don't view myself as host of the show. It's still Richard's show in my mind. Anyway, hey, even man, though I've been doing step up, step, step up to the plate. You're 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 it now. Yeah, yeah, apparently I was. I've been donated. I've been. Uh, Wait, what's the word? donated is not the right. Well, maybe nominated. I have been donated, nominated, nominated volunteered. Or, volunteered. Yeah, I've been volunteered. volunteered. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of a volunteering. A up in Smith College, uh, Smith College. I apologize. Uh, a lone whistleblower has kind of taking on the woke racists up there. And I know, John. This is one you sent here to us. So, what did you have to say about that one? Well, I, I sent it and, and and I maybe should have read it in a little more detail before I sent the because uh, I assume the show was going to be tomorrow. But anyway, um, <laughs> so Smith Smith College, this young lady from Smith College, um, she graduated from Smith College in 1993. She's a single mother, has two children, and um, she has basically been um, just kind of crushed under the woke racism. Um, you know, examples, uh, uh, she'll be in meetings where people are pounding their fists on the table talking about rich white women, rich white women, rich white women, you know, and that's basically who goes to Smith College uh, or used to in the past. And, um, you know, it, nobody, everybody's afraid to speak up because they get crushed by the completely illegal, unconstitutional, immoral, and unjust treatment they receive if they try to. Uh, object to any of the the, uh, the basically racism that's happening on these college campuses and classism. If you disagree with what uh, these newly empowered socialist types uh, who apparently think that all rich white people are bad and all people of color are good and that uh, racial quotas to, to address centuries old wrongs are okay, even though those are illegal and unconstitutional and immoral, then you get crushed under those people. And she um, said, no, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. And sent a letter to uh, a resignation to the people at, at Smith College uh, stating that uh, she wasn't going to. And apparently they offered a settlement and she said, no, no, I'm, I'm facing financial uncertainty, but this is just so egregious that, uh, that uh, I can't deal with it anymore. And, um, you know, there, there's... Uh, and then in in the the rest of the article, which I think maybe we should make some of these some of these articles available for 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 people who want to go into more detail. And we, oh, we post them on with the show. Do we, we do okay. post them. All yeah. right, so here's how much I know. Um, the, um, the there was there was uh, example after example after example. Uh, you know, in, in in one somebody was somebody was accused of uh, filing a complaint on a racial basis and uh, without investigation, without evidence, without anything on hearsay, they uh, put the person who was accused of it on leave and, and uh, published a, a public apology and on behalf of the school and said they would do whatever they could to make sure that this, this kind of racism didn't happen. But what they're actually um, have implemented is, is out and out racism. I mean, everybody is is classed as one way or another based upon the color of their skin. That is racism. And, you know, if you give people favorable um, treatment due to the color of their skin, that's racism. If you give them unfavorable treatment due to the color of their skin, that's racism. So in the name of protecting against racism um, and, and all the other woke things, it's not just racism, it's all the isms, you know, any objection to... Uh, um, uh, yeah, well, if you make into uh, the LBGHQ, whatever it is, I mean, of all the initials, that's that's an ism. Uh, anything that doesn't buy into socialist thought theory, that's an ism. Go ahead. Well, James. Anyway. they've made um, trying to make a, the safe environment for everybody. They've actually made the environment unsafe for a whole lot of people, yeah. whether you're a rich white woman or a straight well, white you know, man or. 
nor any of these other the categories well, we that have, are the oppressive categories. Well, we have to what well, we have to state uh, first and foremost is that racism uh, is is wrong. Uh, what you know, whether it's uh, white against black or black against white or uh, yellow against green, it doesn't make any difference. You know, judging people by race and to the exclusion of all other uh, personal qualifications is just simply wrong. Uh, and when whites discriminated against blacks, which happened uh, from the beginning of our country up until the present day, that's wrong. But likewise, reverse discrimination is wrong. Discriminating against whites uh, to supposedly make up for past uh, racial discrimination against blacks, that's also wrong. It, it's the basic logical fallacy that if, you, if there is an evil, an opposite evil will fix it. No, an opposite evil will not fix an evil. What you need to fix evil is good. And the good is non-discrimination, not reverse discrimination. And Smith College and uh, the entire, the New York Times newsroom, uh, most of uh, academia have decided to go the illogical route of fixing racism with reverse racism as opposed to non-racism. And that's, that's the underlying uh, logical and the underlying uh, problem that we have going on here. And until uh, enough people like the, the lady at Smith College speak up and say nonsense, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a continuing problem. And right now, uh, a lot of people, particularly in academia and politics, are afraid to stand up and say this is wrong. It's wrong for discrimination, no matter where it comes from, or no matter who is the the victim. Yeah, well, it's, we've got. It almost seems like we have a white people being racist against white people, and in in terms of cases like Smith's College, where you've got mostly white staff essentially being racist against their mostly white students. It seems very strange that we're trying to fight racism with more racism and then we end up surprised that we've got more racism running around i have a question yeah um, is this, is this you know it's very similar to what we have in, in monetary policy we have too much debt so we're trying to fight fight too much debt with more debt more racism doesn't fix racism less racism there, fixes racism there, there was a supreme court justice who said the way you end when it, when people were talking about quotas in uh and uh tacit quotas uh, for, uh, I think it was mostly jobs. He said, the way you end racism is by ending racism. In other words, what, what, what Richard said, and what you said, James, earlier, you, you can't attempt to uh, implement one kind of racism to make up for the fact that there was another kind of racism because it's all racism. Um, I get in, in trouble talking to my, my left-leaning friends when I uh, when uh, Barack Obama was elected president, and I asked uh, why that you know what what were the reasons you voted for him? I said, well, and and usually the second or third reason, sometimes the first was he was black. And I said, oh, so you're a racist? Um, and and they got really upset with me, and then I said, so if you vote against someone because of their skin color, then you're a racist. Doesn't it follow that if you vote for someone because of your, their skin color, you're racist? I mean, if and un, and and you know the, the the right in this country is is guilty of egregious things and hate mongering, a different kind of hate mongering. But I think the the left's um, identifying people simply by their race so that they can manipulate them into into their votes is, is kind of some of the most immoral and egregious behavior that I've ever seen in this country. And, um, you know, the fact that, that it's now uh, so endemic in, in academia that, that there's absolutely nothing that, that, like Richard said, people are afraid to speak up, afraid to to even raise their hand, afraid to voice an opinion, afraid to come forward. But this very, very brave lady at Smith College was uh, maybe some other people will step forward as well. I hope so. Well, for families like mine, who's my grandchildren quite literally are racially mixed across the globe, quite literally across the globe. This whole racial discussion is very peculiar. It's like, what race is my grandchild? She has black, white, Asian. My other grandchild is black, white, and Hispanic mix. What race are they? They're the human race. They're not black. They're not white. They're not 
Hispanic. They're not Asian. They're human. Hmm. And at some point, we have to get past all this dividing ourselves up. Hmm. Our next issue is in uh, the Boston Public Schools, they have suspended the new advanced learning classes because white and Asian kids are doing too well. And so because... Because those kids are doing too well, we're going to, well, you don't get to go to advanced classes. You've got to go back and be bored in normal classes because that's what's going to happen. These kids are going to go yeah. back to normal classes and they're going to be bored out of their flipping mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's similar to what similar thing doing. happened in, 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 uh, with my kids that went to school in, in Davis, Davis Public uh, Education. And uh, my two daughters uh, qualified for the gate program, which is similar to the program that you're talking about uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Boston. Uh, you know, gifted and talented education. And uh, if you passed a test, if you, you know, showed that you were, had the, had the, uh, the intellectual uh, cojones to enter the program, you, you did. Uh, and if you didn't, uh, then you went to a normal classroom. When I was growing up, we had the A class and the B class. The A class were, was for the college prep. The B class was, was trade prep. And, uh, you know, it, there are certain forms of education that are more appropriate for different people. Uh, it's silly to take uh, to try to you know to uh, force somebody into college prep whose desire in life is to be a a, a machinist or a mechanic. Uh, likewise, it's silly to force somebody whose desire to be uh, a nuclear physicist into uh, into uh, being a carpenter. You let you let people go where they have the talent to go. Let people go where they have the uh, the uh, God-given God abilities to prevail and l get the public education system out of trying to determine who should go where, whether it's uh, in gifted and talented or whether it's in, uh, in, uh, in industrial arts or whatever it might be. Uh, but I think that the underlying problem is, is one of public education where uh, the government, government schools, uh, typecast people in one way or another, whether it's uh, gifted, whether it's uh, everybody has to do the same thing, whatever it is, if you have no choice, and that's what the people in uh, Massachusetts are asking for, they're saying, don't give children any choice, put them all into the same, into the same stew pot, that is not going to be optimum for anybody other than the mythical average person. And most people are uh, not average, otherwise average doesn't mean anything. Well, that, that uh, absolutely agree. Uh, I think at one time my, my daughter was in, in the gate program um, here in California. So uh, the same thing is happening in, the, they have a, a wonderful uh, public schools or government schools in, in New York that I think 17 uh, Nobel laureates graduated from and they have a test to get into these schools and it is the most rigorous testing, I think, for any schools in the country because they're high schools. And um, um, what was happening is in the eye of the racist administration, the mayor of New York, New York de Blasio, I think, uh, didn't like the fact that not enough, too many Asians were getting into these classes and not enough Hispanics and Blacks, that the, there was a preponderance of um, you know, in some of these neighborhoods, there was a lot of black students, a lot of Hispanic students, um, a lot of Asian students, but the people getting into these schools were overwhelmingly Asian. And people before um, had the same problem when the people getting into these schools were overwhelmingly Jewish um, because different immigration, different uh, classes of immigrants come in and are willing to work harder and they earn their way by bootstrapping. And the same things happened in Boston. Um, but in, in a weird, in a completely different way, the Boston schools are, are uh, eighty percent Hispanic and Black, and the uh, the kids who are qualifying for these advanced programs are are the majority of them. I think eighty percent are white, and somehow because the 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 most gifted people who are passing a completely objective test um, happen to be white, there's something wrong with the program. So um, performance is colorblind. Um, you know, that performance flat out is colorblind. You don't care when you're hiring for a job in commerce or industry or whether you're, you're going in to be uh, operated on. You want the best surgeon. You don't care if that surgeon is pink, yellow, green, black, white, yellow, whatever. You want the best cutter to cut on you. You want to have uh, the best and the brightest in, in positions of authority. And you want to have the best and the brightest 
in critical positions and you want the best and the brightest running businesses so they can create jobs and all the rest of this. And this idea that somehow we have to fill a racial quota at every part of our life is, is no better and perhaps worse than all of the other crazy uh, laws we had keeping blacks out of neighborhoods and from marrying whites and all the rest of this. And it's, it's just immoral. And I, and I thought we were past this as a country, but there's a recurrence of it. And there's a recurrence of it because it fulfills a political need uh, by one party or the other. And that need is a and, and need to make people identify with something so they feel as if they, they are being under someone's thumb so they can get their vote. And that's it, pure and simple. And that's that's why I find it just so totally immorally wrong. Well, it bothers me because it seems that we don't. It's the questions we don't ask because we focus on this. It's like okay, so we have a majority of white kids, despite going into these high over over programs, these these high academic programs, despite the fact that we have a majority of black kids in the school district. How are we screwing up so badly to educate these these black kids that the white kids are, are doing so much better? What are we doing wrong? What are we fundamentally doing wrong with our education system that these poor the, these poor children or these black children or Hispanic children or whatever group of children you want to are doing well? We're doing something wrong. It's not the children's fault. It's ours. Mm. Absolutely agree. Absolutely they're, agree. they're children. And, yeah. you know, childhood is for practice. And yeah. so children failing isn't actually a problem. The problem is when we don't understand why they continue to fail. Mm. And we're not asking the questions of ourselves. No, I absolutely agree. What 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 is going on in these classrooms? What's going on in the involvement of, of parents in education that's working for you know statistically for one uh, one demographic of the student body and not working statistically for another? And that um, you know, in in some case, maybe maybe we can make that that uh, that question less painful by asking it a different way. What are these people doing right? And how can we uh, make what they're doing right? What, are they, what is the environment, the school, the teacher, the parent relationship? What, what's going on that works there? How can we, we, uh, how can we push that out to the people where it's not working? What can, what can they do to look at what's going on here that's breeding success and emulate it so they can breed success? And that's yeah, the way th I'd like to ask that question. But I think we have to be careful because one of the things these pilot programs show us is they, build, they design a pilot program that fits a neighborhood and it does very well in that neighborhood. And then they go and try and take it to another similar neighborhood and it doesn't work because mm -hmm. the differences are subtle enough where you actually have to design each program for each school, mm -hmm. for each individual neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so it, you really can't take this one size fits none approach. Mm -hmm and pass it on. You have to be very careful. Yes, you can take lessons and say, hey, this is what they're doing over here. Can we apply any of that to help us? Hmm. But you still have to take the children that are in your in front of you and say, okay, how do I educate those children? Not how do I educate the mass? How do I educate the non-existent hmm. average? How do I educate the little Johnny and Susie that's sitting and standing in front of me? Yeah. And, and we can pretty much guarantee that will never be done with a top-down approach, which is what a government approach is. It's like you said, one size fits none. I think, uh, you know, put the, put the money for education back in the hands of the parents, put the decisions back in the hands of the parents, and you're going to find better outcomes. And, and uh, I think, you know, if one, thing, if one thing good has come out of this pandemic, well, a couple of things. People have learned how to wash their hands and not sneeze on other people. But the other one is, is they've, they've realized how absolutely horrible public school education is and how completely unfeeling the teachers union representing the teachers are about, you, about their actual job, which is educating little Johnny or little Esmeralda or little Hoisin or whoever it is. They've absolutely proved they have no interest in doing that. They're simply interested in their jobs and their pensions and their power. And I think maybe they'll start chipping away at that power and put, put the educational dollars back in the hands of the parents uh, so they can make whatever decision they want to make for their own children, maybe. Decentralization in choice rather than centralization and power mongering. Excellent. Well, that brings us right on to our next one. The California can now enforce its new net neutrality law. 
Ah. Yeah, we're talking about yeah. centralization and decentralization of choice. Net neutrality is one of the biggest misnomers that I think has ever been foisted on us in the last number of years. And that's saying something because we've had a number of misnomers foisted yeah, on us. I don't, I don't, yeah, net neutrality is, is not, not neutral. It's the opposite of neutral. And it's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, and, and what's interesting is that I, I, the interstate commerce laws have, have basically been used to reach through all to ridiculous levels of local commerce and say, uh, the original case back in the 30s, a guy was growing more corn for his own livestock. Wheat. And wheat. He could, what? He was born wheat. Was, wheat, more wheat. Wasn't he growing feed corn? He was growing wheat? Anyway. He was going, Whatever. going something, uh, and and the they they said that he he must stop growing it because by the act of growing it, uh, he he wasn't going to buy it from someone who could sell it across state lines. So that's how ridiculous the reach of interstate commerce is. But in the one case where it's absolutely and totally and thoroughly interstate commerce, because. By its very nature, the the uh, interweb is diffused across the globe. Um, their their argument is that those rules don't apply. So, state of California can create its own rules, um, and and basically direct who has power and who doesn't in the interweb. Well, I like to call it that just to upset my daughter. We all know it's the internet, um, and and so it's yeah. It's I mean, you have a situation yeah. where the uh, crazy the. Uh, the, the, the lust for power among the political class is so strong that they are essentially ignoring all of the precepts of the First Amendment, the, pre, free, the, right, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, and so on. And any kind of regulation, whether it's net neutrality or, or uh, trying to get uh, Fox off of cable or any number of different things, all of that, all of those, all of those actions are, are, are gussied up to be so in, in, the, in the name of truth and fairness, but what they really are is attempts to stifle voices that disagree with whatever a politician uh, is trying to enact that law. And uh, anything that takes away from freedom of press uh, is, or freedom of, uh, in this case, the freedom of the, of, the, of the internet, which is essentially an extension of press, just like radio and television were an extension of newspapers, uh, it's it's the it's the it's the ability to uh, talk about your ideas without being stymied or uh, throttled by government. That's what net neutrality uh, advocates are trying to do. Yeah, it okay. seems to me it seems yeah. to me that we're putting um, more control of the internet into government rather than getting government out of control of the internet, mm -hmm. and it's it's not a good thing. We've already seen, what was it today? I just read today, somebody, some Democrat lawmaker was demanding Robert Kennedy Jr. be taken off Twitter because of his stance on vaccines. Mm -hmm. But if a politician is demanding someone be taken off Twitter, is that not politicians censoring an individual? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if it's, you and me, if it's you and me, that's one thing, but that's an actual politician, an actual lawmaker demanding of a public company to stop doing business, to stop allowing someone to use their service. Yeah, and as politicians setting themselves up as the arbiters of truth. Now, we all know that uh, businesses have to be truthful in their advertising, etc. But politicians very specifically don't have to be truthful in political advertising. And we all know that politicians, every, whenever a politician opens his mouth, it's not truth that's coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. And setting up politicians as the arbiters of the truth, how, how, how crazy can you get? If their lips are moving, they're lying. So I want to just go a little bit deeper into net neutrality. As I understand it, basically, these these uh, people like uh, AT and T and Comcast and all the rest of that, who've invested trillions in or billions in creating these uh, basically canals, just like the canals in Venice, but they're canals for data, are now being told that they have no control over who or how fast people can travel on the canal they created and they they can't uh, they can't have someone pay them more money so that they're allowed to go faster and they can't uh, have other people who are paying them less money go slower 
But somehow, this is now net neutrality. And um, I just don't, I just don't get how um, people don't see through it that this is once more, as, as Richard stated so very clearly, just the attempt of government to control the exchange of ideas. Because if you control the exchange of ideas, you can snuff the voices that disagree with you and promote the voices that do. Yeah. yeah, well, for your cable operator and you want to say, hey, look, Netflix is using 25% of our bandwidth. And so we want to take a chunk of that and give them, make sure, so make sure our, our, our viewers, our customers always have a solid chunk of, of things. So we want to dedicate 28% of our bandwidth to Netflix. So they always have some, and that's going to mean that some other small person isn't going to get so much. And for you and your, your customers, it's fine because they're all going to notice. But now you have to go to the government and say, hey, Mr. Government, can I actually chunk off this chunk of things for, for Netflix so my customers have a better experience? Well, I like and my that, Netflix, man. I don't want to mess we, with We need Netflix. to uh, avoid being uh, defenders of uh, AT&T and Netflix. Well, and, no, and, I, and, I agree. Uh, I, cable I, I agree. Because I'm not they're, defending they're, Netflix. They, they all have... Yeah, they all have sweetheart deals with the government. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of total deregulation entirely mm -hmm. of the internet. Well, I think, yeah. uh, I, I that's, that's, that's the direction we need to go. And we're going, the politicians would have us go in the exact opposite direction. Well, I think yeah, pretty soon the, the 5, 5G is going to fix a lot of this. Uh, and I agree that AT&T had a monopoly for years and it was broken up and then it bought its way back to one. And Comcast certainly does in its area. And and there was way too much regulation of the internet and all the rest of that. But, you know, I mean, once somebody's invested actual money in something, um, you know, telling them they can't charge whatever the market for, for, will bear is, as long as you let somebody else, you know, invest the same money, you know, somebody else wants to string cable. But once 5 G's all over the place, um, it's going to be a whole different world out there. You can, you can, uh, once there's enough towers up, you'll get, you know, faster speeds through the air, which was available for years. And the, the people who fought it were who? These very cable companies that you're talking about and the government, because they don't want the freedom of information to pass through the air. They yeah, and, it, and now we're looking at, 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 we're looking at, now we're looking at satellite internet. Uh, Elon Musk is putting up a whole bunch of low flying satellites to provide uh, internet service to underserved rural areas, as well as every place else. There is no shortage of methods by which uh, competition can enter the uh, the internet space, and it should be encouraged, not discouraged. Yeah, yes, Star absolutely. Starlink is actually quite exciting because it can actually create a second internet if they so choose. They can simply avoid all this problem of the the controlled internet here and have their own Tesla internet up in the sky, so to speak. If <laughs> you know, he has Tesla he built net. the. He built the, he built that technology in there, and it's it's a strange thing. So we may be very well someday be having two internets. You may get space internet and Earth internet or some such thing. That is all the time we have for today, gentlemen. Thank you for for joining us. Thank you with, so much. Uh, Appreciate from it. those here's Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint show in Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.